No, I did not die. No, I did not quit. No, I was not abducted by the CDC and the ATF on some joint interagency sting operation. I was only digitally imprisoned by Her Majesty and Royal Highness, the Queen of YouTube, Susan Wiki Wiki. Peace and blessings be upon her. And of course, if you follow me nowhere else outside of YouTube, you heard nothing about this because YouTube doesn't notify you. YouTube doesn't allow me to notify you. YouTube just disappears me for however long they see fit and leaves you to assume I just took some abrupt 180 degree turn in my life and said nothing about it. So what happened? Well, Susan put me in the YouTube dungeon for alleged medical misinformation on the Sunday stream, April 4th. They gave no specifics other than I have defied the overlords at the World Health Organization. I appealed and Susan consulted with President G and Dr. Fauci and they still said no, you are hereby banished to a week in the wrong thing gulag. And I can't know for certain what did it because they won't tell me. But that was odd considering I've talked about the political impact of a certain virus of 2019 origin every week on this channel for more than a year, often on highly skeptical terms. So what was different about this particular week? It's highly likely that this is what happened. A listener sent me a joke hit piece article, portions of which I read on the stream. And in that article, he wrote that the stream is a cure for this hypothetical and certainly non-specific ailment of current relevance. And even though that was an obvious joke, you can't talk about cures for this hypothetical and certainly non-specific ailment in any context. Recall the doctors that YouTube banned last summer for discussing a prospective treatment that started with an H that I also probably can't reference. All I can say is Susan, I'm sure, is watching these chemistry videos about hydrochloric acid very closely. But I'm back now, so things should return to normal so long as it pleases Susan, of course. I'll still post videos and do the streams at the same schedule, but my channel is on the ropes now. If they ding me again in the next three months, I face the prospect of an outright channel deletion. And of course, YouTube won't notify you if they do that. So if you enjoy this material, and you'd be sad to see it yeeted, please bookmark my website. That's mattchristensenmedia.com. I will always have the latest content and any important notifications posted over there. And all my social media accounts are another option. I would greatly appreciate following me on something other than YouTube or Twitter, since those are the two platforms most likely to suspend me immediately on a whim, and both have in recent months. All the options are linked below in the description and over on my website. Ironically, this YouTube suspension came at a very convenient time, actually. Earlier this week, I had both some work being done on the house in preparation for the baby and a doctor's appointment for the baby. I actually had to tear down this entire set right after the stream on Sunday and put it back together to make videos later in the week. So I wasn't gonna have a new video for you on Wednesday anyway. And all of that is great news, thankfully. That work on the house is done. Mom and baby are both healthy, but I don't have totally new material for you right now. Only the material I would have posted last week, but that Susan would not allow. So I figure now is a good time to fill you in on what happened, and rather than spam you with a whole bunch of videos, just package everything up into one long video for you to check out if you missed. And yeah, these stories aren't immediately current anymore, but I hope they're still worth your time. The first video is about Portland police officers quitting their jobs in massive numbers and ripping the city in their exit interviews. And the second video is about claims made by Joe Biden and media on guns and gun control last week that are just completely made up nonsense coming from people who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And above all, Thanks for keeping me in the game. I was absolutely enraged last Tuesday when Susan suspended me. But the number one calming factor outside of my family itself was knowing I have an incredible audience of supporters who stick around, Susan or not. I know that you don't quit, and I certainly don't either. So thank you for that. On to the videos. It was about this time two years ago when I made a video talking about how smearing the police is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you exaggerate how poorly your community is policed, the more poorly policed your community will become. If you demonize police officers unfairly, nobody of good character or talent is going to become one or stay one. Why would good people sign up to be cops knowing they'll be hated, harassed, often even targeted, no matter how much competence, skill, or compassion they show on the job. That is all risk 
and no reward, and nobody will take that deal. And that was obvious two years ago in Portland when the police bureau and city leadership were confronting the problem that they simply couldn't attract qualified applicants to be police officers. They had more than 100 openings and they couldn't fill them because 85% of applicants didn't even pass a background check. Because it turns out when you constantly say the police are scumbags, only scumbags show up to join the police. It was obvious then, but the police bureau in the city refused to acknowledge it, instead sticking with their usual ideologically driven nonsense, like attracting more diverse officer candidates will fix the problem. Equity applies in two places, really. It applies in the delivery of police service, outward facing, and it applies in the, our relationships with our employees internally, our recruiting, hiring, promotional decisions. Yeah, it's really weird how not enough black people apply when you sell the line that the police exist to hunt black people. Also weird how diversity is driving the problem here when the bureau at the time was headed by a black woman and is currently headed by a black man. Diversity of the police has not stopped the maligning of the police, as long as city leadership and residents are bent on doing that regardless of race. And sometimes, even based on race. Why are you guys talking property? with this guy? There's nothing he could say or do short of quitting his job that means anything. I've been called a Uncle Tom, I've been, I've been called a turncoat. It is what it is. Do something, nigga. What did you just say? Nigga, with an A. So, <laughs> with an A. So, and you know which white guy specifically? The one who's been standing over there for hours oh. holding a Black Lives Matter sign. So, can't say that shit regardless, bro. A e -R there you go. A -R, no matter what, you're not supposed to say it, bro. There you go. Don't try to follow the logic. The only logic is fuck the police, white, black, red, green, or otherwise. And until you correct that cultural problem, color will be an irrelevant variable and quality police officers will keep leaving the force or never join at all. And their departures have continued throughout the last two years. And until now, we had to infer that hostility toward police and city leadership that encourages it is the reason the Portland Police Bureau can't recruit or retain. And that's not an unreasonable inference, of course, but you'd always like to know for sure if you can. And now you can. Just since July, 115 Portland police officers have retired or resigned. That's 13% of the force in under a year's time. And thanks to a public records request by the Oregonian, we have access to their handwritten exit questionnaires. And some of these just Meet the mockery with mockery. One of the responses asks simply, the only differences between the Portland Police Bureau and the Titanic? Deck chairs and a band. And the commitment never to let go, apparently. This guy's just dunking Jack in the ice water and moving on with his life. One question asks, what factors would have enticed you to stay longer? A departing officer responds, none. Portland has become a cesspool. Another writes, the mayor and the city commissioners are a train wreck. And I thought for sure, that would make Portland history's first poop train. Until I did the research, and it turns out there is actually historical precedent for such a thing. The only difference is, in this case, citizens actually successfully fought back against such injustices. Anyway, the rest of the criticisms are much more sincere and specific. It turns out you don't have to take my speculation that a diversity commitment won't work. You have police testimony to that effect. A Latino officer says he was excited to bring his diversity to the streets, but his efforts were viewed as unprofessional and not confident. I'm not sure if he was carrying maracas instead of a baton or what, but it didn't work out. Another writes that the last three police chiefs were obviously put in position for reasons beyond qualifications in an effort for the mayor to try to curry favor with the vocal minority of the public, draw your own conclusions on what he means by that. A common policy theme among the responses is defunding and budget cuts. Budget cuts that put the community at risk and make working for Portlanders a waste of effort, says one officer. The threats of defunding make the job's future uncertain and the prospects of layoffs higher, write others. Beyond a lack of financial and resource support, police also cite a lack of rhetorical support and double standards coming from city leadership. One officer writes that city officials need to be held to the same scrutiny standards as the police bureau. Another questions why the police bureau is held to the highest possible standards, but city leadership can lie and malign the police bureau without scrutiny or consequence. Another writes, he was just plain old disrespected by the city council and the district attorney. And as we can see plainly on the outside, departing officers also reference a department and a city 
driven by ideology and politics first. One writes, City Hall is not capable of separating policing and politics. This will be the beginning of some of the worst times this agency has ever been in, he says. Another writes that city leaders are partisan agitators who would rather make decisions based on their hatred for Trump at the time than the right thing for the community. And so instead of good or better police, you get bad police as a consequence, or just fewer police. And depending on what resources are available when you call 911, fewer police can mean no police at all. And then you get to learn the hard way that despite whatever criticisms you may have, police do still have a vital function, like stopping criminals from murdering you, or at least giving it their best shot. Portland has already exceeded 20 plus homicides on the year. That's just three months time. For perspective, in all of 2018, there were 26. In all of 2019, there were 35. 56 in 2020, a significant increase, but if this trend holds, 2021 is on pace for over 100, a staggering jump. And perhaps you think that trend is coincidental, that maybe Portland's treatment of its police officers doesn't necessarily cause the increase in murder rate. Well, if it's coincidental, it sure is a trend that's coinciding in a lot of different places. Austin, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, and more. Places that cut their police budgets are seeing significant increases in homicides. To reverse that trend, two things are useful. Number one, an armed citizenry to defend itself from the criminals. And number two, a quality and capable police force to respond. Ideally, you have both, but Portland is experimenting with a culture that has neither. Contrary to the propaganda, that is not utopia. Unless you're one of the criminals, in which case you get free reign. Which puts city leadership in a weird spot, because either they'll have to watch those murder numbers climb and become the dog in the burning house saying this is fine, or perhaps they'll have to acknowledge that maybe police have some role in putting out those flames. They cut their so-called gun violence unit last year, and are now quietly acknowledging that, yeah, maybe police had some usefulness in addressing that violence. Last year, amid calls for change in policing, Portland eliminated its gun violence reduction team. Then last month, the Portland Police Bureau launched a new team to address gun violence. It features 15 officers, six detectives, and a goal of partnering with community groups in their efforts. And the question of why this is exclusively a gun violence squad when the murders are not exclusively by gun aside, the other irony is that the FBI is now jumping in to help. The FBI wants to help police curb gun violence. On Monday, Portland's new special agent in charge, Kieran Ramsey, said he's been talking with local law enforcement agencies, the mayor's office, and the U.S. attorney about the issue. Okay, so Portland neglects its own job, cuts its own resources, lets its city rot, and then we all foot the bill with federal resources. And remember, mere months ago, those federal agents were Trump's personal army who had no business in the city, according to the mayor. So I guess he doesn't have a problem with personal armies on principle. Personal armies are just fine, as long as they're armies for persons he likes. And certainly, as long as they're armies that you're paying for. It must be nice to appease the mob by saying you've defunded the police while sending the bill to the neighbors in other states who don't enjoy the benefits or suffer the consequences of your decisions. I hope they do, but I highly doubt the mayor or city leadership will actually read any of these notes from departing police officers pleading with them for sanity, even though the city's total abandonment of it is the reason these cops are jumping ship themselves. As long as somebody else is picking up the slack for the city's disastrous decision making, they have no reason to assume any responsibility for it. In fairness to them, though, that is the philosophy by which we're all supposed to operate these days. You don't have to work. You don't have to be responsible. You don't have to make decisions for yourself and enjoy the benefits or suffer the consequences. Just sit back, relax, get nothing done, let life pass you by, watch the world burn, and wait for your check of Biden bucks in the mail. On most issues in politics, I think rational, informed minds can disagree. Two people can look at the same set of facts and understand that set of facts thoroughly, but have different interpretations and solutions while both still being fully informed on the issue. It happens all the time. The issue of guns and gun control, though, is something entirely different. It's been said by many others, and I agree totally, 
This one breaks cleanly between people who understand the issue, people who understand firearms, people who understand firearms law, people who know what they're talking about, and people who don't. And I don't even say that for mockery. It's just the truth. I can offer my own experience to speak to that. Just five or so years ago, I used to buy into the so-called common sense gun control narrative because it seems so obvious. Any good person wants to keep dangerous weapons out of the hands of dangerous people, but that's all my opinion was. It was just a good feeling. I had almost zero knowledge of how guns work. I had almost zero knowledge of the law around guns. I had zero experience ever buying a gun, yet somehow I still had somewhat strong opinions about something I had no understanding of. And then after Parkland, all the gun control rhetoric got me thinking, hey, if this is something that these activists want to take away, the same activists who want to restrict speech, the same activists who want to tax us into oblivion, the same activists who want to bastardize every right I hold dear, this is probably something worth learning about. And so I did. I got a concealed carry permit. I bought a gun. I learned weapons proficiency. I learned how to operate them. I learned how to maintain them. I learned how to build them. And naturally in that process, I learned all the specifics of the law of what I can and can't do with them. And learning the subject in detail changed me from a common sense NPC to seeing clearly how uncommon the sense actually is in our system, how heavily regulated the system already is, and how any further piling on is just unsensible infringement on the law-abiding American citizen. In other words, simply learning the facts changed my opinion nearly 180 degrees because this issue breaks down cleanly between people who know what they're talking about and people who don't. And if you don't believe me or you think that's oversimplification, consider the ridiculous ill-informed statements made by activists and politicians alike on this issue in just the last few weeks. Harvard student David Hogg says it shouldn't be easier to buy an AR-15 than it is to vote. Except it isn't. That is a statement only uttered by someone who has never bought a gun. You'll need an ID to do it, David, as racist as that is, and several states will impose a waiting period on you many days worse than those long voting lines you cry about. Some states even ban the transaction or possession outright. Now, I'm not aware of any state doing that with voting. And unlike your ballot, I've never heard of anybody receiving an unsolicited AR-15 in the mail. If you have heard of that, please tell me where. I'd like to live in that state. Joe Biden stood at his podium on Thursday and just lied his decaying ass off about some gun show loophole nonsense. Most people don't know it. You walk into a store and you buy a gun, you have a background check. But you go to a gun show, you can buy whatever you want, and no background check. That is a claim so inaccurate that even PolitiFact had to rate it mostly false. If PolitiFact is forced to go after a Democrat, you know the lie is completely indefensible. There is nothing special about gun shows in either federal or state law. Anybody in the business of selling guns in this country requires federal licensure and will perform background checks on transfer. Now, if you buy privately from your Uncle Bob down the street, that is a state's issue to regulate. Some states require a background check for that. Others don't. But gun shows have nothing to do with that distinction. And if you think you can just walk into a gun show and walk out with a gun, no questions asked, go ahead. Try it. Make a video of you doing it and post it. If you think it's just that easy to do, show us you doing it that easily. The Attorney General of the United States also stood at that same podium and said pistol braces on AR-15s make them more concealable. Such braces make high-powered pistols more stable and accurate while still concealable. Well, I mean, he's got a point, I guess. Like, I bet you couldn't even tell that I've been concealing an AR-15 pistol this entire video. I just walk around town, I say, hello, fellow law abiders, and I still haven't been caught. Now, I know not all of you are gun people, so I don't mean to glaze your eyes with technicals, but just to explain to you what he's talking about as quickly as possible, per federal law, you can't have a rifle with a barrel under 16 inches unless you register it with the feds and pay a tax. But you can have a pistol like this, which isn't a rifle because it has no stock designed to be fired from the shoulder. So manufacturers have gone right up to the line in making these pistol braces which technically are designed for arm stabilization and not shouldering, 
So this configuration is still legally a pistol and not a rifle. Technicals summarized, Joe wants you to believe that the Boulder shooter was way more dangerous because his AR had this piece of plastic on the butt end of it. And this piece of plastic magically gave him special deadly powers he otherwise wouldn't have had. A stabilizing brace hook and a pencil essentially makes that pistol a hell of a lot more accurate and a mini rifle. As a result, it's more lethal. That's what the alleged shooter in Boulder appears to have done. But it's just a piece of plastic. It does not change the ballistics of the projectile flying out of that barrel. This is like arguing that the flaming paint job and the spoiler make this Mustang better for running people over. But no, it works exactly the same in the hands of a person who intends evil with it. The president has no idea what he's talking about. The attorney general has no idea what he's talking about. And the media covering them have no idea what they're talking about either. On Thursday morning, ABC News ran a piece explaining Joe's forthcoming executive orders and they repeated the same misinformed falsehoods. They also want to regulate what's being called a stabilizing brace. These are accessories that can turn a pistol into a short-barreled rifle. No, they don't convert pistols to rifles. That's the entire point of them. They keep the weapon in a pistol configuration and thus not subject to additional regulation. And that's not my opinion. That is the long-standing legal rule from the ATF on the books for years. But this is where it gets really hilarious. If you're keen on this issue, you may have noticed something important about the gun that they showed during the story as a demo for a pistol brace. And indeed, the gun they show in the thumbnail for this video, it has a pistol brace secured to the shooter's arm, yes, but it also has a vertical foregrip on it. And that is actually a big no-no. If this gun is a pistol, you can't put a vertical grip like that on it. Otherwise, it's federally restricted, just like a short-barreled rifle. If you possessed the weapon they showed without registering it, that is a federal felony that gets you up to 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Now, in full transparency, I did my research, and it turns out the original photo they used comes from a 2013 brace review, and the gun in question was, in fact a federally registered short-barreled rifle. So the guys who took the original photo were not actually breaking federal law, but that is not what ABC News was showing you. They were showing you this picture with the premise that this is a weapon that anybody can freely possess without additional regulation. It isn't. That's not true. In other words, they have no understanding of the guns or the laws they're reporting on. If you or I or the Boulder shooter, for that matter, had the weapon that they just showed without first clearing an extensive FBI background check and paying the feds a fee, we would already be breaking the very federal law that they're oh so excited to expand. But there's no expansion necessary. What they just showed is grounds to get your wife sniped like they did at Ruby Ridge or to burn your kids alive like they totally didn't do at Waco. Whatever you believe, if you put that piece of plastic on your pistol, your dog is going to sleep. My point is not the technicalities of what shapes of plastic are legal and what shapes of plastic aren't. My point is that the president and the attorney general and their media lackeys have no understanding of that anyway. And we shouldn't be debating about shapes of plastic regardless, as though those are what enable a depraved mind to kill and not the depraved mind itself. But if we do, we should at least be having that debate among people who know what the hell they're talking about. These people do not. And that's the point that I hope sticks with everyone who's not a gun person, who has no interest in guns, who frankly doesn't care what shapes of plastic are banned and what shapes of plastic aren't. There are much broader principles and considerations at stake here. Do we want to set the precedent that people with absolutely zero knowledge on a topic should be regulating that topic, not through legislation, but through the old slow wave of a decrepit man's finger? And maybe you even think that guns aren't regulated strictly enough. Okay, but even if so, do you really want one guy making policy for the entire country? When you leave lawmaking to legislatures and you leave issues to the states, you decentralize the capacity for mistake making and you ensure that mistakes are localized and, importantly, escapable so that one idiot's mistake in California doesn't drastically alter life here in Montana.
and vice versa. But if instead we grant the power to that one idiot and his mistakes to rule us all, the only variable that can save us is how many mistakes he makes. The only prospect for things working out is perfection. And perfection, of course, is an inhuman trait. I wouldn't trust even the strongest and smartest among us with that sort of power. So I certainly wouldn't trust the guy who can't even remember the name of the agency he's directing to regulate the issue he doesn't understand. I'm proud to nominate David Chipman to serve as a director of the AFT. David knows the AFT well. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Luke Keen, forward to it. Goodbye.